Hi there, I'm Savannah Mextra with Manor Law Group, and I'm excited to welcome you to another webinar Wednesday with esteemed elder law and estate planning attorney, Robert Manor. Today's webinar is dedicated to Michigan's graduating seniors. Today, Bob will be discussing the most vital legal, do legal documents that every graduating college and high school senior should have as they're starting their young adult journey. Now, before I pass the torch to Bob, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping details. Uh, first, a disclaimer. Um, while today you're going to hear some really informative and educational advice, you are not going to get legal advice uh, specific for you. So it's going to be information, not advice. If there is something that you're looking for specifically for you, I encourage you to contact us after the webinar. And Bob will talk about this more later as well. Also keep in mind that today's webinar is recorded. If for some reason um, you get pulled away or if you're thinking, wow, I really wish I could share this information with somebody, um, just know that we will be sending out a replay link tomorrow and you can share that email with family and friends. Now, if you have questions throughout today's webinar, um, please utilize the chat box. That chat box is available for you to leave questions and we will save some time at the end of today's webinar to go over this, uh, those questions. If you're watching a replay and you're not watching live, um, then I encourage you to email info at mannerlaw.com with those questions. Now, why should you listen to the folks uh, and at Manor Law Group and what we have to say? So first you should know that we're a nationally recognized and respected elder law and estate planning firm. All three of our, estate, uh, all three of our attorneys are accredited by the Veterans Administration to assist veterans with claims and appeals. Attorney Bob Manor is nationally board certified as an elder law attorney by the National Elder Law Foundation. He's one of only 19 attorneys in Michigan to achieve this designation. He's currently on the executive board of the State Bar of Michigan Elder Law and Disability Rights Section and past president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, Michigan chapter. Lastly, one of my personal favorite reasons, Manor Law Group has been honored by readers of our local newspaper as the best or favorite law firm for the last eight years in a row. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome attorney Bob Manor. Hi folks. So we're gonna get right into this. This is always an, an interesting topic and something that a lot of folks never really think about. They think about, uh, you know, we even use the term elder law when we're talking uh, about some of the practice that we do. And so sometimes it really seems like we are um, focused on older folks and of course, you know, that is the case. But at the same time, a lot of times we don't think about it from the standpoint of technically when somebody turns 18, they're an adult and the parents actually have no access or information, no ability to get information uh, in an emergency or in other situations. So today I thought it would be useful, especially in graduation season as we're getting uh, we had a, a unique, uh, you know, always unique graduation season with uh, with college graduates and high school graduates. And so in graduation season, we decided that it would be appropriate to talk about, well, what should every adult really have, but particularly young adults, and why is it important? So we're gonna look at it from a parent's perspective and whether or not you can still ha help them make decisions, um, or what about if there's an emergency, things like that. What about from the young person's perspective? Um, <clears throat> and then there's a real important uh, question about uh, children with special needs and how uh, it's uh, a particularly important question. So we're gonna address that. One of the things that we, when someone uh, is an adult, we really think about it. So should we be making decisions for them? Well, not necessarily, but often the parents still need or would like, and even the child would like uh, for the parent to have access to information uh, or the ability to ask questions or talk to the doctor maybe, maybe talk to the university or the school. Um, and then we've got this HIPAA law. This is a particular, particularly important one for parents as, as, uh, as the children turn 18. And obviously beyond that, so even if they're out of college and things like that, uh, having access to information through the, uh, the privacy law, HIPAA law. And we'll give you some instructions about what you can do to improve the situation because uh, that's what this is always about, is uh, getting some tools about, well, how do we make things so that if bad things happen or if different situations happen, that we're able to improve it, we're able to have access, we're able to have options, we're able to have choices. 
And that is what estate planning is all about, right? Choices and options and making sure everything's going to work properly. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how would, if you were a parent or if you're the young person themselves, how do we go about getting those documents? So let's, without further, let's kind of dig right into it. Of course, uh, Savannah mentioned this disclaimer. We're always concerned. Uh, you can't make decisions. You can't give uh, legal advice to a, a, in a group setting. Uh, legal, advice, legal advice is always going to be specific to the person. That would be like a doctor giving uh, medical advice uh, about taking a prescription or something like that to uh, a, an audience of 100 people. Well, that wouldn't be very wise, right? So same thing with legal advice. All right, so let's start off from a, from a parent's perspective. So, you know, this is always an interesting thing when we, when a child is graduating, maybe they're getting out of high school, maybe they're getting out of college, are we able to help them? Should we, you know, make decisions for them? And that's a whole other question, but the, the question is whether or not you can, you know, uh, it's not even a question of you should. So that's obviously a, a personal family situation, but the question is whether you can help them. Uh, make decisions? And the answer is, when somebody turns 18, a parent actually has no legal authority over them anymore. Uh, you could, of course, get, potentially get that authority by going into court and having a judge giving you that authority if necessary. Um, if you've been around our law office very long, you know that that's not our favorite thing to do. We, we Ideally, we have things set up for families so that they don't have to run into court and they don't have to uh, have uh, that uh, kind of difficult process of going through court and having a judge have final decision-making authority and things like that. So what we often recommend is that we say, okay, well, why don't we put things in place that says uh, if appropriate and if there's a sufficient trust and, and uh, agreement on both sides, that we have the ability of the parent to at least have access to information at least be able to help from time to time. So uh, first question, can I still help uh, them make decisions? And the answer is, unless we have legal documents in place or a court order, which we're trying to avoid, the answer is no, you don't have the ability to, uh, to get access to information, to be able to help them in a pinch. If there's an emergency, can you, can you be able to write checks for them, things like that. It kind of goes to this last question I have at the bottom of uh, should I put them, you know, should I have them put me on their bank account? And the answer to that is no. Also, surprisingly, I think a lot of people will hear that answer and think, oh, well, of course, if they're 18 years old, of course, their parents should be on the bank account. I'm going to give you a couple of examples why that's really not a great idea and how there's a better answer. And it's a really straightforward, simple, better answer. So, um, you know, can you still have uh, help them make decisions? Do I have access to information? No, if they turn on their 18th birthday, if they, uh, if you wanted to get, you know, talk to somebody at the school, they're supposed to not answer your questions because you no longer have legal authority for them. It's a university or even if it's, they're still in high school, potentially, you no longer have legal authority of them once they turn 18. And so we should probably get those legal documents in place so that at least you can ask questions, at least you can talk to people, you can talk about information that's relevant to the, to the child um, and get that information and, and help them make decisions and sometimes help them in a pinch uh, if they're uh, out of town and they need a bill paid or they need access to something or they need help with uh, negotiating uh, you know, adult things, uh, then, then uh, parents can't do that without uh, you know, clear authority. And once you turn 18, they're adults, and so you don't have that authority. What if they went to the hospital? So you may have heard of this law called the HIPAA law. Uh, a lot of people think it's like HIPAA law, but it's actually HIPAA, H-I-P-A-A, -A, HIPAA law. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And uh, so often when you go to the doctor, you go to the hospital, you'll sign one of these HIPAA releases that says you, that you're given permission to talk to certain people. And you might, it might say, I give permission uh, to, for you to talk to my parents. But of course, in an emergency, in a hospital situation, they might not be able to give that permission, right? If there's a car crash or if there was something else that happened or, you know, something bad happened, you know, at the school, at the, at the university, at, at the hospital, something happened. Hospitals are really not supposed to disclose information without the permission of the, you know, child who's 18, over 18 years old. And so 
uh, my advice is we deal with that. We have the, that information in place. We have the documents in place that would, as long as the child agrees to it, because obviously if they're 18, they're an adult, they, they can say yes or they can say no. But I think we should have those things in place ahead of time. And they're really relatively straightforward and, and not costly and things like that. All right, so what about, uh, I mentioned this earlier, should, should you have uh, your kids add you to their bank accounts? And my answer is no, and I'm going to give a couple of examples of why that's a really bad idea. But then the question is, but, you know, a lot of parents would say, well, I mean, I set up the account for them. Of course, my name's on it. I set it up when they were five years old or 16 years old or 12 years old or whatever. And my advice is take your name off at 18 and get a power of attorney in place instead or, or some other uh, mechanism so that you can help them, you can still have access to it, but your name's not on it. And there's a number of things. There's liabilities associated with it, so that, um, that uh, you know, your name's on the account, uh, if something bad happens to you, it could affect your, your child's finances. Uh, but the bigger issue, that's not as big of an issue, it's a bigger issue once you get older, why you, why older parents should not have their kids' names on it, because now the kids' problems could affect the older parents, the, the parents' money. It's not so much of a problem the other way around that something bad that happens to the parents is going to affect the 18-year-old. However, that is an issue. And so that's one of the things that we often look at. Um, you know, certainly an 18-year-old is not thinking about, well, what if they go into a nursing home or something like that? That's certainly not, I mean, it happens, right? There are terrible, terrible things have happened and young people have had, you know, needed 24 hour care for the rest of their life, uh, but they're not thinking about that. The, the question is, well, what if the parent went into the nursing home? Well, the money in the child's account counts towards the parent's nursing home costs. And so I always say, you know, as soon as they turn 18, let's get the parent's name off there. If you still wanna have access, be able to help them, be able to help them pay bills, things like that, let's get a power of attorney in place. And I'm gonna explain what the power of attorney is in a minute here. But I really don't think it's a great idea to have you uh, keep your name on it. And there's one, the big reason. Okay, so those are all, oh, what if, what if, what if, uh, but there's the big reason. And the big reason is, uh, I see this all the time. I work with a, a, a couple in their 30s or their 40s, and we still have mom and dad's name on their bank account because they have the same bank account they had when they were 18 or 16 or whatever. And that can create complications because they just never get around to taking it off. And so if you don't take it off at 18, are you gonna remember to do it at 25 or 35 or 45 or 65? And now we've got a, some trouble here because as things, as they get older, there's complications, there's liabilities and things like that. And now often the bank will say, oh, well, you know, you gotta bring your mom in take her name off that account. You can't just take somebody's name off their account without their permission. They gotta come into the office. Well, mom might be in Florida by now. It's 30 years later, mom might be sick. Mom might have dementia, mom might have, you know, whatever. So it's one of those times I just say, look, if they're 18, probably best to take your name off the account. You need to be able to have access and control, potentially not necessarily control, but be able to help. Uh, let's get a power of attorney in place, but get, probably get your name off the account. But I see this all the time when I'm working with uh, what I consider younger folks, meaning, you know, people in the 30s, 40s, even 50s, and they'll still have their uh, parents' names on some of their accounts. And it wasn't, um, it was, you know, just because it was the same account they had when they were 15 years old and they never got their parents, their mom or dad's name off of it. So I just think this is as good a time as any, and that's my biggest uh, answer for that as to why. Now, some people say, well, I wanna be on there because I wanna be able to help them. If they're away at college, I need to be able to help them pay a bill or if they're, you know, something happens, I wanna be able to have access to that. Well, that's what a power of attorney does, right? That's why it's better just go ahead and take your name off it. You're not an owner of the account anymore. We're gonna talk about this in a little minute. You might wanna have access, you don't wanna have ownership. You don't wanna own their account anymore. Once they turn 18, you wanna have access potentially. You wanna be able to get information potentially. Um, that's what a power attorney does. So we're going to get into that. All right. What about from the perspective of the child? So obviously there's going to be a lot of different answers for this. Um, and so the thing on this is that, um, you know, for the most part, most kids are going to still want, uh, to have the parents have, you know, some ability to assist them to get information to be able to help them. 
they're still going to, whether they admit it or not, they may, they're still going to be a bit reliant on their parents when they're 18 or 22 or 25. And they still are going to come to you for advice and they're still going to want some help. That's not the case for everybody, right? And so there might be some children that would say, no, I don't want my parents to have any access or any information. Okay, well, let's think that through. Um, because would you want to have your parents have information or access in the event of an emergency? You know, uh, sometimes kids do some interesting things. And so if you got, you know, into some trouble, if you were uh, on spring break or a vacation and you need somebody to have access to it, uh, what if you got in a car accident and went to the hospital? You know, if you can't make your own medical decisions, what if you're unconscious? Who would you want to make those decisions? Now, maybe it's not your parents. A lot of times it is, right? A lot of times you'd say, well, my goodness, if I'm in a, um, in a car accident, I wouldn't want the hospital to have to run off to the court and have a judge decide, you know, what happens next. I'd want my parents to be able to do that. Again, not every family is the same, but a lot of families, that's certainly the way it is. And you don't necessarily have that ability to make those decisions unless we have those proper legal documents. And I'm gonna go through specifically what those documents are. There's really only three documents I can think of that I really would say, look, if you're 18 years old, 25 years old, whatever it is, there's really three documents I'd recommend. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go through those. And none of them are overly complicated. It doesn't have to be complicated at this point. It doesn't have to be costly at this point. Just you know, make sure that we've got um, the information in place. And that's, you know, do I want parents to be able to make decisions in an emergency? Would I want them to have access? Would I want them to be able to communicate with my school? Um, you know, things like that. All right, what about, uh, so I'm gonna um, go a little bit off uh, of, of that for a second before I get back to the specific legal documents that are involved. Uh, and I do wanna talk about this. So what about parents with uh, children with special needs? A lot of times we don't think about this because, you know, uh, parents that have raised a, raised a child with special needs uh, from birth. And so, you know, of course, they're making decisions for them all the way. Sometimes they have, uh, you know, um, as they get older, maybe they still have the, uh, the, the decision making ability of a younger person, meaning that they might be 18, but they still process things like a, someone that's six or seven, something like that. And so uh, we just assume that, you know, it's always been this way. We've made lots of decisions for our special needs child and we'd always, it would just continue. Well, it doesn't, um, but we're, you know, there's nothing legally that says when they turn 18, that you still get to make those decisions. In fact, the presumption uh, is the opposite, that they, that on their 18th birthday, you don't get to make decisions. You don't even necessarily get to communicate with the school. So you, they might still be going to, uh, to primary school because, um, you know, not even college, uh, a lot of folks, uh, children with special needs, they can go through high school and, and some other types of uh, education through age 26, and it's still considered part of the, you know, high school experience. Um, and so I've had lots of folks that call me, and they have a 19-year-old or 20-year-old, and they have some issue with the school, they call up the school and they say, well, we can't talk to you. Your child, even though they're still in high school, so to speak, or still in this, this program, uh, we can't answer your questions. And so, because they're over 18. Now, what a lot of times we hear is, oh, well, the school said I had to go get guardianship. Remember, guardianship is going to court and having a judge appointment. Well, here's what I don't like about going back. Several things. <laughs> First of all, why get a judge involved in something that we don't need a judge involved in, right? That's, you know, costly and time consuming and all of that. Secondly, is uh, it's not, it's often not legally necessary, right? We can do that through a power of attorney document. Um, and uh, we don't, uh, you know, want that. Uh, the third thing is, in order to get guardianship, you have to declare your child incompetent. Incompetent under, you know, and you may say, well, they're not competent to make all of their decisions, but are they competent to make some of their decisions? We really want to declare an adult, an 18 year old, incompetent. I don't want to. We don't have to legally have the, the state of Michigan <laughs> declare that. I don't want that. I don't think that's a great idea. I think it has all kinds of complications and all kinds of problems by declaring an adult who is able to make some decisions for themselves and, say, and have a court determine 
but they're not able to make any decisions for themselves. I think that's a bad idea, right? Um, now, sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes you have to be able to overrule your child, and sometimes that means getting a guardianship. But often, what I suggest is, um, if they're competent to sign a legal document, there's capacity versus competency, right? Capacity means the ability uh, to pick who they would want to have help them make decisions. And that's different from the ability to balance your checkbook, okay? There's a difference between the ability to balance your checkbook and manage your money properly, and then the, the ability to decide who you want to have help you with that. So if there's if they meet the standard, and there's different standards for that, and if they meet the standard for uh, the ability to help have them decide who they want help from, and they choose you, we can do a legal document called a power of attorney and a healthcare document and a HIPAA waiver and all of that, and do most of the things that uh, the court would allow you to do uh, without having to, to have them declared incompetent, without having to go to court, without having to do any of those things. Now, there sometimes comes a time where you actually have to overrule your child. You feel that your child is not making uh, good decisions and they do not want you to be their power of attorney anymore. And they would uh, you know, try to overrule your decision making and they're over 18. And so sometimes we have to go into court because we can't, you know, we can't work that out. But ideally, we work that out so that you're appointed as the power of attorney, as the healthcare agent, as the healthcare proxy, um, and that we can do it that way. Maybe, maybe uh, um, the um, uh, payee under Social Security, if they're receiving any Social Security. So there's a bunch of ways that you can have access and control for a special needs child without having to run into court. And I look at having to go into court as sort of last case scenario, because it's, um, I don't, you know, it's I, just because someone has special needs doesn't mean that they don't get to make their own decisions, okay? That they don't get to make some of their own decisions. And so I don't like having to declare that they can't, uh, which is what the court does, if there's a way around that. All right. So that's and it's cheaper and easier and convenient and better for family. And, you know, really, uh, that's ideal. So that's just really important. I know that's a little separate from the, the conversation about uh, just uh, your uh, all the other graduates are in the bigger conversation. I just want to mention that because it's really important if you have a special needs child once they turn 18. Let's get some documents in place so we don't end up having to run into court in an emergency. All right, so let's talk about this. Financial versus medical, access versus decision-making. I mentioned earlier, I don't like the idea of having you be on their accounts. Um, and so on their accounts mean you own it. And do you really want to own their account and, and have the you know things that associated with that? And my typical answer is no, I think most parents don't want to be an owner of the account. They might wanna have access. They might wanna have information. They might wanna have even control in some circumstances. Well, you can do that through a financial power of attorney. Sometimes they call it a durable power of attorney. So the first of the documents we want to talk about is the durable power of attorney for finances. And uh, when we get that, we want to make sure the bank has a copy of it, right? Uh, you don't want to go in in an emergency when the bank's never seen it and uh, then try to use it and have the bank say, well, we got to send this to our lawyers in New York or we got to you know, do this. Let's go ahead, you get the document, you know, let's have the bank have a copy of it, have them approve it, have go, them go through whatever process they need to go through uh, when it's created, not when we need it, not two years later when there's some kind of an emergency, but at the, you know, let's use that when the time comes. And so same thing for anybody that has a power of attorney. My recommendation is you give it to your financial companies, your, your bank, all, all those types of things. And uh, then they're basically appointing to you to say, they're not giving up control, okay? So you have an 18 year old and they say, well, I'm not gonna give you power of attorney. I've heard on a movie that, you know, if I give somebody, there's all these movies that abuse the idea of a power of attorney. And they say, well, I get, you know, on the movie, the person gave power of attorney, that means that they lost all control. They don't lose any control. When you give somebody power of attorney, they still, you still have the ability to make all your own decisions, including the ability to revoke or tear up that power of attorney, right? So just because you give somebody a power of attorney, it's not like that now they have power of attorney forever. It's just a, um, a thing. You can even have a deadline in there that says this power of attorney is good for two years or you know whatever, you can decide to do that. Um, but the idea behind this is you're not giving up anything by signing a power of attorney. 
You're just saying, I trust this person, my dad, and my mom, uh, to be able to assist me and sometimes make decisions for me if necessary, if, uh, you know, uh, be able to have access, be able to pay a bill for me if I need them to, those types of things. So that's what a power of attorney is. And uh, they, the person that signs it has the ability to revoke it or amend it or change it or, you know, get rid of it completely. Uh, and they're not giving up. They're not giving up the ability to control their own money. Of course, they still control their own money. They're just appointing somebody to assist them if ever necessary. And it may be that that you know what, that that power of attorney never gets used. Uh, I again say that we should give a copy of it to the bank and things like that so they have access to it. But um, if you know you're going to be glad you have it in an emergency. Same thing with maybe the university, so that the university has a copy of the power of attorney if they're going to school. So that's for financial decision making. Um, and then there's the medical. Okay, so this is a little bit different. First of all, with the financial, often it's going to be where you both have the ability to pay bills at the same time, to have access at the same time, to have decision making at the same time. With medical, that's not the case. With medical, it's either or. The person, the, you know, the young person or whoever's signing the medical power of attorney or patient advocate, um, they always get to make their own decisions. And this document is only invoked in the event that you are incapable of making that decision. So the only time a patient advocate or a medical uh, power of attorney is invoked is, or usable, or you know, that it has any authority or power whatsoever, is either because the person signed it is either unconscious, they're not physically able to say what they want, or two doctors have specified that they're not competent, they're not able mentally able to say what they want. That's the only time that a medical power of attorney or a uh, patient advocate is has any authority whatsoever, okay? It's also important to know that those are two separate documents. Because of that distinction of when they're used and how they can be used, it's not one document. You can't have one document that does all of the above. We have one for financial and one for medical. We also might not want that to be the same person. You know, we might want uh, it to be uh, our parents for financial, but our sister for medical. Uh, it obviously has to be somebody over 18, but uh, it doesn't have to be the same person. And often it's not, especially as we get older, we might have, uh, you know, one child is financial, one child is medical, or something like that, or our spouse. Or so there's one other document that's really important, probably the most important document in my mind, is this HIPAA waiver, the healthcare privacy law, okay? It has been interpreted to apply to so many different things, including bank accounts and life insurance, and uh, you know whether the hospital can even tell you that the, your son has been admitted there, that your daughter has, uh, you know, been in an accident, or what's going on, or being able to answer questions. So it's so important to have that. So so much so that whenever uh, somebody gets checked into a hospital or they go to a new doctor, it's almost always one of the things that they have them sign is that healthcare document, right? And I mean the HIPAA waiver. And so, uh, but the issue I have is twofold. Number one is, what if they're not capable? What if there's an emergency? What if there's an accident and they're not capable of uh, waiving the HIPAA law at the time? So I'd like to, you to have one on file that says, okay, if I need it, I can access this information. Same thing for a university. University often won't disclose information to you or won't answer your questions because of the HIPAA law. Now I say, well, how's that related to healthcare? Well, it's been used to deny access to a lot of information. So. If your child is able, is willing to let you uh, have access to information, uh, we'd want to make sure that that could be used through the university, through the school, through the uh, hospital, through the doctor, you know, whatever. Um, and so the second thing is sometimes people will say, oh, well, can't, aren't these documents, the financial power of attorney and then the healthcare power of attorney or, or patient advocate, aren't those HIPAA compliant? Yes, they are. However, sometimes we don't want to have somebody to have to be declared incompetent, like you would under the healthcare document, in order to get access to information. Somebody doesn't have to be incompetent in order for them to have their want their mom to be able to ask questions to the doctor or have the hospital release information to them. They don't have to be in, declared incompetent for that. So this really should be a separate legal document. So those are the three documents I'm recommending for anybody who's 18 and above. And particularly going off to college and you know things can happen and you know crazy scenarios can happen in college or uh, off on uh, spring break or anything like that you might need to have access to information and maybe even the ability to 
to uh, you know make decisions if, if um, appropriate. So those are the three documents: a financial power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, your patient advocate, and the HIPAA waiver. Uh, that is basically the uh, presentation for today. Uh, Savannah, are there any questions that we want to address? And uh, if not, I want to make sure that we have, uh, that Savannah gives you some instructions. We have an ability, if you're a parent or a grandparent and you want to get this, uh, these documents set up for a graduate of yours, or if you're the graduate themselves, I know a lot of 18 year olds or 25 year olds aren't really focusing on this kind of stuff, but so often it has to be sort of a parent or grandparent that's kind of pushing it forward. Uh, but if you're, if that's a gift that you would want to give your, your graduate, uh, we do have a, a discounted package for graduates at this time. And uh, we'd want to, you know, gather information, make sure it's appropriate. So there's a real quick 15 minute phone call that we'd have with you. Um, and uh, Savannah's going to tell you a little bit about that and how you'd get that 15 minute free phone call. But like I say, we have a discount available for graduates to, to get these vital documents. Thanks, Bob. Um, and thanks again for sharing this information. Very, very helpful as usual. Um, so uh, we don't have any questions for today's webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and just hop right to those instructions that Bob was mentioning. Um, now, if you're watching live today, um, you are going to get an email in the next maybe 15 minutes. Um, that email will have two options for you. Um, the first option is if, like Bob mentioned, you know, yeah, I, I do have a teen uh, who is turning 18, graduating, definitely needs this. Um, I'd like to make that 15-minute interview appointment. Um, you'll click a button. You'll schedule a, a time that works for you. Um, and our team will call you on that day and time and just ask you a few questions, gather some information, and then we'll move forward from there. So quick and easy. Now, if you're not quite sure that you need an appointment, maybe you just have a question or a concern, or you just like a little bit more information, we've got you covered there too. In the same email that's coming to you, um, you'll also have a button that you can click. It'll take you right to our website um, where you can uh, actually just ask a question or um, inquire about something else right there on the website. Our team will respond to you within 24 business hours. Um, and that goes for anyone who's watching on the replay, um, because the replay for today's webinar will be sent out um, tomorrow. Um, so if you're watching the replay and you have a question or you would like to schedule an appointment, um, I encourage you to just go to www.mannerlaw.com and uh, click on the contact us and you can reach us there directly, or you can always call 810 694 9,000. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. Uh, it's been great having you and can't wait to have you next week.